welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC. I'm Christine Alexander, Craig Burley, Frank LaBeouf, yes, here yep. in the studio. Welcome back. Thank you. It's, you a, real pl- it's a real pleasure. And Craig, well, he's even happier. When, it wasn't when I walked in the door and I saw you. <laughs> it's like, what the hell is he doing here? I just wanted to see you. It's I like, remember you said you were coming, but... No, no, I know, but you don't remember. I heard you. You don't fact, pay attention I to what I them. say. I was halfway along the corridor and I heard them talking. <laughs> I was like, no. He's lying, I have to tell you. He's <laughs> absolutely lying. And he, he, eavesdropping yeah. in, the, in the halls of ESPN, you Craig. Don't, you don't need to eavesdrop with him. <laughs> You don't need eavesdrop. Very, very true. I wish we could eavesdrop a little bit on uh, Manchester United because uh, the latest reports indicate that Cristiano Ronaldo has asked to leave the club. And, of course, we bring in Mark Ogden and Sid Lowe to talk a little bit more about uh, CR7's future, which is now uh, apparently uh, up in the air, at least with the Red Devils. Uh, Mark, what's the latest on the situation uh, with Cristiano Ronaldo and Manchester United? Well, the situation is it's pretty clear. Ronaldo does want to leave United. He wants to carry on playing the Champions League. There are other factors. He cited the fact that his family had a difficult year in Manchester last year. Obviously, that his wife, his girlfriend, lost the lost the child. So they've had a tough year. And I think he wants to move on. He wants to end the best years of his career away from a club that's in the Europa League. Now, there are other factors like he's probably been unimpressed by United's transfer recruitment this summer, which has been zero so far. The new manager started pre-season training last week. So the, the one thing you could say about Ronaldo is that he's left it a little bit late. If, if it was all about playing in the Champions League next season, then he knew for six, seven, eight weeks ago that wasn't going to be a, a prospect at United. So he wants to go. The official line from United is that he's staying, he's not for sale. But I think behind the scenes, there's a re- an acceptance that if Ronaldo wants to go, United would be, it'd be a futile battle to keep him. So I think it's a case of finding the right club now. And they would hope that would be outside the Premier League. But ultimately, it comes down to what Ronaldo wants and who can afford to pay him. Uh, so the priority for him, Craig, is to play the Champions League? Yeah, I mean, it is a bit strange, as Mark said. He could have just said, announced it at the end of the season, said, look, it hasn't gone the way we wanted and this is what, what I need. I can understand that from his point of view because Man United is a total rebuilding job. Uh, they're hoping that Eric Ten Hag is the future, for sure. And he hasn't got that much time at that level. You know, he's, what is he, 36, 37 now, still very fit, but, t- but Mother Nature catches up very quickly. And I think from his perspective, you know, Europa League for Man United is okay short term. But I think from his, pers- from his perspective, he's looking at, what, a World Cup and then through to next summer and who, who knows what state his body's going to be in. So I-, I-, I can understand that he wants to get out and play Champions League football. It's, it's going to be very uh, hard for the United fans to swallow <laughs> this announcement because, as uh, Craig mentioned, it's a bit late. And, uh, and you're losing one of the best players in the world, if it's the case. But at the same time, I understand. I understand his feeling and the fact that he wants to play the Champions League, that he has what, a year or two to play at the top level, maybe. And he wants to, uh, to carry on you know, being famous and being successful. Uh, he hasn't been a great season collectively but he has has been a good season for Ronaldo scoring many goals and he wants to be a product productive again and still but in Champions League yeah and Mark you talked about not necessarily thinking outside the Premier League so where could we possibly see Ronaldo the next season well there are very limited options I mean the amount of clubs that could afford him and would want him it, it, you're probably talking three or four max so I'd imagine that Bayern Munich could be keen because they're probably going to lose Robert Lewandowski to, to Barcelona. So Ronaldo for Lewandowski would make sense. Whether he's a buy-in sort of player, I'm not too sure. PSG are always in the market for a, a big name, although Ronaldo and Messi together might be kind of complicated. And you, I suppose you can never rule out Real Madrid. And, you know, Sid might have a better feel for it than I do. But, you know, Ronaldo and Real, you know, he, he had such a great time there. And I think he would love to go back to Real Madrid, whether they could take him back. But they'd missed it on Erling Haaland this summer. Maybe missing out on Mbappe as well. Maybe, whether... Ronaldo to Real Madrid for one more year for you know a last dance in Madrid who knows but he hasn't got many options I don't think he goes to the US this time because they can't afford to pay him so he really is struggling Chelsea obviously in the Premier League is an option but I don't think United would let him go to a rival team in the Premier League because they want to be back in the Champions League next season and although it's going to be a tall order I think that United, Chelsea and Arsenal are probably fighting for that fourth spot already with City, Liverpool and Tottenham seemingly ahead of the, the rest of them so far because of the transfer dealings this summer so for me, United looking at getting him out of the club and out of the country, but it's going to be difficult. 
Yeah, and to think about a comeback now with Real Madrid, of course it would be romantic like we saw it when he uh, announced now his team with Manchester United. But Sid, what do you think of this remote or not possibility to see him back at the Casablanca? I suppose the short answer is to say it's not not an idea that had really crossed my mind, I must admit, because it, it feels like Real Madrid, they went through a very difficult spell immediately after he departed for a, for a year or so. There was a real sense that they were they were missing his goals, that this wasn't the same team, they weren't decisive, they didn't score enough. Um, but they've overcome that. And in particular, of course, we've talked a lot, haven't we, over the last 18 months or so, maybe even a little bit more than that, about the evolution of Karim Benzema, the importance of him, of taking on responsibility, not just for creating for others, but also to score the goals. And, and you just want wonder where that would leave that relationship and whether Cristiano Ronaldo has a place within that structure and, and you, you have it's true a forward line that was expecting Kylian Mbappé and doesn't now have it so in theory at least there is an extra forward that you could be looking for but while Cristiano Ronaldo on the face of it could be the third of the forwards it just doesn't feel like it fits with the evolution of Karim Benzema and I'm sure there will be an emotional component a, a part of the fans that think actually wouldn't it be lovely but also he kind of had his time and there's always a risk isn't there when you have a comeback that what you once were you're not anymore and, and, and that kind of it doesn't damage the legacy but it changes it a little bit. You know, it's my concern about that is uh, he comes back, and we we see that many t many players like Pogba, for example, coming back to Juventus. But what you left is not what you're going to find out. Yeah. Some people have evolved, uh, like uh, Benzema. He's be he became the leader, the captain, and he's, uh, he's he he's not. If Ronaldo comes back, he's not going to be behind Ronaldo and serving him anymore. And you have the emergence of uh, players like uh, Vinicius and Rodrigo, uh, Rodri or Rodrigo. Uh, Rodrigo. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be different. Where, where Ronaldo is going to play, and you have to move everybody, and that's going to be more a problem than um, something that you can find and help your your team out. So, so I don't see. For me, it makes no sense. Well, comebacks are tough. Mm -hmm. it, it, we saw it with Zinedine Zidane, not, not even as a player, but now as a coach. But Craig, uh, going back to what Manchester United should do, should they? How hard should they fight? to keep someone like him? Well, they were slow off the blocks on, on Darwin Nunes, and so they were well out the race uh, on that signing. He went to Liverpool. Uh, Cavani's gone. They have nobody else at the moment. Unless, you know, I don't know, is, is Robert Lewandowski even a, 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 you know, is he even uh, in the frame? Could Man I mean, would he go to Man United? We know he's set, set. I mean, I'm just throwing names out there. Yeah. They, they've got the clout, they've got the finances. But does a if, if Ronaldo goes, where, where does that leave them? They've got nobody. Anthony Martial won't come in and play. He's been hopeless. Mm -hmm. Marcus Rashford was a striker when started his career, but he's pushed all over the place. They have nobody then if Ronaldo goes. But this goes back to the decision that he and his team made to go back to Old Trafford uh, just over a year ago or whatever it was. This was nostalgic nonsense, right? If we'd looked at the bigger picture here, he would have seen a United side that, that, that yeah, finished second in the table, but only because they huffed and puffed and got there and everybody else fell by the wayside. <laughs> they had a manager that should never have been in the job. He surely must have known that. Right, they did sign some good players like Rafael Varane, but he had a problematic season. They already had problems with Harry Maguire at club level. Jadon Sancho hasn't fitted in, and then there were all the other uh, issues on the periphery. So if he had been really smart, uh, he would have known that maybe it wouldn't have been as bad as it was last year because it was a shambles, but, it, but at best it was going to be a scramble to get in that top four. And this is now sort of coming back to bite him in the backside. I mean, it's difficult to adapt to a different team, especially after you had Sir Alex Ferguson. We know he's still there, but of course with a different role with the Manchester United. But Mark, I want to ask you the same question with what Craig said as nostalgic nonsense, but do you still see any potential? Should Manchester United fight to keep Cristiano Ronaldo? Well... <laughs> If Ronaldo leaves, it solves a problem and it creates a problem at the same time because it's, it's, it's the classic dilemma. Does Ronaldo score the goals that make you a better team or does his presence deny the opportunity to be more of a collective? So I think if United think about it properly, they will let him go because Ten Hag can then rebuild properly without the guy that's costing half a million pounds a week in wages. But he's the guy that scored more goals than anybody else last season. So I, I think Ronaldo's left United in the lurch a little bit here. I think he's left it so late that, as Craig said, They've missed it on Darwin Nunes if they ever had a chance of beating Liverpool to win in the first place, which I doubt. 
Robert Lewandowski's heart sat on Barcelona, so if he doesn't go to Barcelona and ends up at United, I'd imagine that Barcelona would make sure that Frankie de Jong doesn't go to Man United, and they need a midfielder. So they've missed out on even players like Richarlison, who's now gone from Everton to Tottenham, who could have done a job for a year or two, a proven Premier League goal scorer. It's, it's left United in a really difficult position. The only good thing if Ronaldo leaves is that it frees up a lot of money on the wage bill to bring somebody in. But all the deals have been done. Haaland's done. Nunes is done. Richarlison's done. You know, Gabriel Jesus has gone to Arsenal. They're in a real bad situation. And it's because Ronaldo has left it so late to tell the club he wants to go. You know, this should have been done two months ago. But for whatever reason, it hasn't been done. And maybe United have buried their heads in the sand a little bit by not actually addressing it when they couldn't. Ten Hag could have said right at the outset, I need to speak to Ronaldo. As soon as I could took it, took the job in, in May, June, I need to sort the Ronaldo situation out. We're in July. They're supposed to be going to Bangkok on Friday on the first leg of the summer tour. Is Ronaldo going to be there? Why has he not been addressed before that? So everybody's at fault here. But the ultimate problem is there's no solution because all the best deals have been done already. There's no short-term solution, but this is the kind of pain you might have to take for all the sort of bad recruitment, I'm afraid. Because he's not the future, is he? Oh, no. He's just not the future. No. So all you're doing is putting some more band-aids over it until you can possibly get somebody else. Or do they say, as Mark was saying, look, you know, OK, we're going to have to live with this. We might have to adapt. We might have to bring somebody on a loan. Maybe we'll just sign somebody short-term who's a little older. Uh, or maybe we'll just go and, and try and do what Liverpool and City did for a season or, or, or so, is play and just mix everybody around. I mean, it's leaving the manager short, there's no doubt about it at the moment, if it was to happen. But looking at the bigger picture, getting them off the wages, he's way too old, and United really have to have a longer term approach to this problem that they have. Well, the thing is, uh, he's got another opportunity for Tenag to, uh, to get another player from Ajax, um, uh, Ajax <laughs> because he seems to get all the players from there yeah. to, uh, to, uh, to uh, create a new team because he has to. Uh, but, uh, but it's going to be a, a problem, another problem. And the, in fact, the, the status and the image of Manchester United uh, doesn't go well with that new uh, new announcement. I, I think it's not well. It's not good for for the club because uh, that club deserves better results, but a better pitch, uh, image also. Well, it's the status that they've been trying to get back for so many years, and it seems to be a little bit difficult. Now, uh, you mentioned Ajax, Tenag. We know they had a successful run with him, of course, in the Champions League. Here's what Juan Laporta had to say on Frankie the Young, who knows that Ajax team well. There are many clubs that want him, not just Man United. We have no intention of selling him. He wants to stay. I'm going to do everything to keep Frankie, but there's also a salary issue that would have to be adjusted. Now, not only that, here's a sport cover too. Palanca activada. So this is a little favor now for Joan Laporta, a, a teeny tiny favor of 207.5 million euros to of course now spend on these transfers. We heard from Gemma Soler yesterday uh, telling us a little bit about what the plan is now to get several players and now apparently in that plan is still Frankie de Jong. Uh, Sid, does it surprise you to see Laporta saying this today? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it, it's surprising to hear him say it in terms that, that seem so decisive. I think one of the things that was interesting, though, is watching him say this. This was a, a, an event um, uh, to, to honour Joan Cruyff today. He was very calm. He, he stood in a, in a circle of, of journalists for about 15 minutes and talked through all sorts of elements of, of what Barcelona are going to do now. It wasn't a kind of a, a classic Laporta performance. You know, it wasn't bombastic. It wasn't pugnacious, albeit the, the, the words when written in black and white looked very, very strong indeed. I must admit, I thought they were a little more tempered than they look in black and white. I think he was calm about it. And of course, he said... But, of course, there needs to be a conversation about the salaries of players. And so I think we, we, we have to look at this in the context of the fact that we know there are negotiations ongoing with Manchester United. We know that when you say, I'm going to do everything I can for him not to go, there is still a possibility that he does go. Because, of course, you need the economic um, impact that, that a sale of this would, would have on the club. We know that there's not just sporting criteria in play, there are economic criteria in play as well. But it was, it was uh, quite striking to hear him say this, that I want to keep him. I, I think, in a way, this is a message, isn't it? It's a message to, to, to Frank de Jong that if you are going to stay, we need to talk very, very seriously 
about your salary and we need to look into that not just Frankie de Jong's by the way but everybody's and, and, and perhaps as well a message to United to, to, as, as, as in to say to them we don't need to sell this guy and we're not going to sell this guy in other words the offers have to be very very big for us to let him go I don't necessarily mean uh, think that this means it's guaranteed that he stays but it was definitely an interesting step back towards that yeah welcome yeah, to great. Manchester United Eric Ten Hag <laughs> season's not even what <laughs> The season's weeks away and he's already having a really bad weekend. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? True. He's got all of a sudden Barcelona may be doing an about turn on a key player that Man United want and need. And on top of that, uh, you have one of the biggest players of this generation deciding that he wants out of the club. So <laughs> if you want to know the hurdles that, that the new manager at Man United needs to go over and has to get players in, it's going to be a long summer for him till the end of August with all these twists and turns. When you think you got a player, when you think they need the money, all of a sudden things change. And yeah, it, it's going to be an intriguing few weeks till the end of the transfer window, particularly for Manchester United and Eric Ten Hag. And we're not even talking about the start of the season yet. No. I mean, this is something that's just beginning now for Tenag. Like you said, welcome to, to Manchester United and welcome to Barcelona, too, with the economic problems. I say that, of course, you know, uh, has been a hot topic for the last years now, and especially with Juan Laporta now at the center of it. But my question is, and I'm sure a lot of people have the same question, where is this $207.5 million coming from? Let's try and make this as simple as we possibly can. Um, this is a deal with a, with a company to essentially sell 10% of the TV rights money from La Liga TV rights that Barcelona will make for the next 25 years. Now, at the moment, Barcelona make 166 million euros. So in other words, every year, 10% of that, 16 million euros on, in terms of the current deal, but that deal could change, will go to Sixth Street, this company, for the next 25 years, which comes to a total of around about 400 million euros. In other words, Barcelona would half the amount that they take for that 10% of the TV rights. But of course, in return for doing that, essentially selling an asset or selling potential earnings, they're going to take 207 million euros now. The other part of this is that Barcelona have got an agreement from their members to sell up to 25% of the TV rights. So they want to do another deal like this for 15% more, which they think they can get closer to 400 million euros for it. Now, of course, if we extrapolate that 10%, it takes us to 311, 312 million euros. They think they can get better that, than that, get as high as 400 million euros, which of course would make the total amount of money coming in now 600 million euros, which would put them in a position where they could start buying players again at a rate of one euro spent for every euro they bring in if they reach those targets and also if they reach some of the other targets in terms of reducing salaries across the board. So it puts them in theory at least in a much better economic position. It also saw them through the economic year. It was really, really important they did this before the 1st of July. And as Laporta said today in this, in this conversation, and as I say, he was very calm in the way that he, he analyzed this, which isn't always his way because he's normally very kind of, very pugnacious, he's very enthusiastic <laughs> this time. It was very calm, talking through it. He said, look, what we've done is we've taken the pressure off. By getting that first 207 million euros, we've now taken the pressure off. And now we can think calmly between now and August about how we do this. Do we sell uh, a, a share of the, the basically the retail branch of the, of the club, Barca BLM, Barca Licensing and Merchandising? Or do we sell another 15% of the TV rights? That's their intention at the moment, according to him, that if they can sell another 15% of TV licensing of the TV rights and get enough they might not even need to sell BLM, let alone go selling all their players. There's still a long way to go, but they feel like they're in a much better position. And do you think that it's a good plan what they have right now, Sid? Well, look, I, I, think, I think we have to put everything in context. And, and, and of course, the context of this is that this board uh, inherited a mess. And the way they, they, they described themselves as, there, there was a phrase a few weeks ago where they said, well, when we took over, the club was clinically dead. Now we're in intensive care. What we really want to do is get down onto the ward and be able to, you know, to, to eventually recover and come through this and come out the other side. And so given that situation, they're in a position where they absolutely had to hit budgetary targets before the 1st of July. So is it a good idea to sell 10% of the money you're going to make from TV rights over the next few years? Well, no, of course not, because you're, you're essentially releasing an asset, but you need to. And so in that context, you need to, and so it's a, it's a risk you're prepared to take and it's a, it's a financial transaction. The next question is, what's the next best way of moving on from here? Is it another 15% sale 
of your TV money, or is it maybe to sell 49.9% of BLM, which is one of the things they're talking about, and build that into a joint venture. Now, these are business decisions, which of course go hand in hand with sporting decisions. And you also know that you need to reduce salaries across the squad. You know that you need to generate money through, through prior sales as well. But all of this comes as one big package. Now, remember a few weeks ago, we were told by the, by the uh, by Laporta himself, I think it was, or, or the vice president, I must confess, I can't remember which one of the two it was now, said that even if we make 600 million euros right now from what's been known as these financial levers, it would not necessarily put us directly in a position where we could just spend happily. A few weeks after that, the president of La Liga said, well, if they can get to 500 million euros, they'll be all right. Now they're saying they feel like they're closer. And why do they feel like they're closer? Because they're more optimistic about player sales. They're more optimistic about bringing players in for the kind of fees they want, about being able to spread the cost over. And they keep saying, we won't be stupid. We won't just throw money at things no. now, even though, of course, they recognise that they have to sell, have to buy lots of players to build, build the squad up. There was a lovely line from, uh, from uh, I think it was last week or the week before, it said, it's very difficult to breathe in and breathe out at the same time. And that's, of course, okay. what they're trying to do now, to save money, but at the same time, bring players in. And that's a really difficult balancing act. I carefully listened to what Sid said. And for me, it's just postponing the problems, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, you have to sell players. You have uh, the possibility to sell Frankie de Jong. You don't. So you're, go you're already going the wrong way. And you and I, if we are in debt, you know, it won't happen to Craig because he's very rich, but uh, it can happen to us. Our banker will come to us and say, you know what? Before, if, we give, if, we, if you get some money, before spending it, you know, you will have to, you will have to, to recover and, uh, and make sure that uh, your debts are completely um, at zero. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't happen to them. I know Strasbourg in France and Bordeaux this season, they're going to be relegated with the administration because they are in debt. Uh, that, that club, I'm sorry, I have nothing against Barcelona, but they have to pay for that. They have to be punished at a certain point. They are 1.6 billion. They get 207.5 million and they spend it on players. No, I'm sorry, for life, society doesn't work like that. Viewers are look, watching us and saying, why they don't pay for what they owe first and then recover? Because it's going to be maybe the end of Barcelona for maybe 10 years. But it has to be like that. Some people have to pay for their mistakes, mm -hmm. huge mistakes. And for me, they get the money and they carry on. They carry on making mistakes. I'm, I'm curious. So I, think, I think in Barcelona's defence, yeah. it, it, it might, sorry, sorry uh, just think in Barcelona's defence, or maybe not in their defence, more, more a case of trying to kind of explain some of the mechanisms. Um, there, there is, there's a couple of different things going on at the same time here. One, of course, is the overall economic situation of the club. And the other is the question of, of fulfilling the financial fair play rules in La Liga, which, by the way, are rules that are put in place before the event rather than after the event. This isn't a case of looking at your, your, your money and saying, right, you have to pay a fine or you have to you know, pay some sort of punishment because you've broken the rules. If you try and register players and you are not within that criteria, you simply cannot register them. So, so in that sense, Barcelona have already paid for their mistakes. And, and, and one very simple way of explaining that is that they, they lost Lionel Messi. Now, the greatest player in their entire history, they lost him because of that financial difficulty. The other thing that we should probably explain here is that this 207.5 million euros that comes in is just a part of an attempt to regenerate money. And so that doesn't immediately go, here's 207 million euros, mm -hmm. that's 207 million euros on spending on players. It doesn't work like that. There's a huge amount of balancing going on. So it will be that, there'll be the hope maybe of somewhere closer to 400 million euros for another 15%. Then maybe, maybe the BLM thing will go through as well. There will be some sales, I am sure, of players. There will be some players who depart, that they try and save money on their salaries. For example, Leng Le, although they'll have to pay a bit of that. They'll try with Umtiti, but it's not that easy, of course. And this is what they discussed last summer they had a whole load of players they thought they could move on that just said well no, actually I'm staying I'm not going anywhere <laughs> and so this all of this goes hand in hand there are a lot of operations going on so it's it's not it's not entirely fair uh, I think to say well here's 207 million euros and look they're spending it again well they'll spend some of it and they'll spend some of it if they can balance across the board not just here's my money and out it goes again yeah, which we know with that balancing act, of course, it would be to try to sell maybe Frankie de Jong. So my question, Mark, is it true what Joan Laporta is saying or is this just a strategy to maybe get Manchester United to pay a little bit more? 
I think he's bluffing in terms of there's a, a lot of clubs that want Frankie de Jong. Of, of course, a lot of clubs would like Frankie de Jong, but this summer the market is, is different. And Frankie de Jong is on the top of anyone's prize list apart from Man United. I think if you look around the clubs in Europe, if if there was another buyer out there, that Barca would have been able to negotiate a bit harder. I was told a couple of days ago that United and Barca have pretty much agreed a fee. What is holding it up is de Jong. De Jong is reluctant to leave Barcelona, but knows he may have to. So United and Barca are, are ready to do business, but it is an issue with De Jong and his wages are factor for United as well as Barcelona. Apart from his huge wages at Barcelona, wages that even United wouldn't pay. So he has to decide whether to stay at Barcelona and, you know, make it difficult for them to bring the players in or, or to go to Man United. So for me, this isn't about a lot of other clubs wanting Frankie De Jong. I think Laporta is bluffing on this, but I do think that United still have a battle to get it over the line because he isn't convinced by... This, this horrible word project that Ten Hag has got at United. It's not a great project if people like Ronaldo want to jump ship straight away, but, you know, it's still there to be done. And at the moment, it's not done until it isn't done, until it is done, I should say, then he's a Barcelona player and you can never trust Man United to get a deal done until it's done. If they can force United, though, to pay another 10 or 20 million, you know, for Barcelona at the moment, that, that, that goes a certain amount away. So, yeah. you know, it could be a, it could be a bluff in, in that way. Uh, and why wouldn't you play a, a sort of strategy saying, oh, yeah, you thought you were getting De Jong, but things have changed for us, so maybe if you want him now. And as Mark has said many times in, on this show, United have been very slow in coming forward. They've just wait and wait and wait and they've left managers out to dry. But if Barca think they can get 10, 15, 20 more, why, why wouldn't they do that in, in their predicament? And let's, let's be honest, it's a 50-50 split here because they need the money and Manchester United, they need the players. So, yeah, someone's going to have to give on this one. I, I think this deal will get done, it seems to me. But it might just cost Man United a wee bit more than they initially thought. Yeah. I think it's a strategy too from from Let's play Yeah, yep. yeah, absolutely. And he knows how to play the game. And so do these fellas on ESPN FC, available daily on ESPN Plus. Well, there was good news for Liverpool fans. Salah is here to stay. Mo Salah signed three more years with Jurgen Klopp and company at the Reds. And now uh, we were talking about the lack of deals that Manchester United has been able to complete. How does this compare with what Liverpool is doing, Craig? Well, I mean, they don't have to strengthen the back line. Uh, and uh, they brought in Diaz and... January, who was a terrific signing. Obviously, they've got Jota still there, uh, who was sort of superseded a little bit after his superb intro uh, by, by Diaz. Firmino was off form, but I mean, he had an average year by his standards, but who's to say he won't come back again? And now Darwin Nunes, one of the hottest young talents, 22 years old, comes in from Benfica, really tough uh, South American who scores goals, attacks the ball. You know, can link up play, he's got good pace, and the main man does not go to Real Madrid or wherever it is he's going. <laughs> I mean, I think he's got to be pretty happy. Now, I've no doubt it cost uh, uh, Liverpool a few more quid than when Frank and I signed, <laughs> yeah. we signed for Chelsea, oh, yeah. but they don't have, they have, they've got the transfer money from Manny, or the, okay, they've spent it on Nunes, uh, but Manny's off the salary as well, and they were able to give that guy a little bit extra to keep him, so yeah. I mean, you think about it, if you lose Mane and Salah, you, ha you have to go back to the market and replace them, and that's an awful lot of money. For the fans, the, the signal would have been awful to lose Mane and Salah at the same time, you know, where you still try to, uh, to, to keep the, the level, and, uh, which is one of the best levels we've ever seen, you know, for decades, you know, for Liverpool. And if you want to fight against City, Real Madrid, and maybe Chelsea or Bayern Munich, you have to, to keep Mo Salah because with his experience, with his talent, of course, uh, and with the, the, the players coming, coming, coming up, like Nunes, you need those players alongside them uh, to make sure that you, uh, you keep the, the power that you had. And they're keeping him happy, clearly, uh, Mark, Mohamed Salah. Yeah, absolutely. And he's, he's been given a huge pay rise and the pay rise will go even higher if he wins things and score goals. And he's done that throughout his Liverpool career, so he's going to be a very wealthy man. But he, he deserves it. I think some players you know, mean much more than what they contribute on the pitch. And, and Salah's been Liverpool's talisman now. And I think if he left, like the guy said, it would be a massive blow, even if he left next summer on a free transfer. So 
it, it, it's probably Liverpool's best signing of the summer they could possibly make. But I think it's not only that. I think you know the guys are obviously you know we're, we're comparing Liverpool to Man United unfavourably in Man United sense, but. You know, behind the scenes, Liverpool just get it right. You know, the, Michael Edwards, the the sporting director, who's been credited with much of their success in recent years. Now he's left. He he handed his notice in last November, been replaced by a guy called Julian Ward. But the the transition has been seamless. Now you look at what's happened at United over the years when Edwards replaced David Gill and when you know Edwards was gone now and and they changed the, the system again. And United are still falling over the feet. Liverpool just move on brilliantly. You know, Mane's gone, Minamino's gone, Origi's gone. But they just find this way of just rotating the, the the squad and getting players in, and you know Jota and Diaz and now Nunes, fantastic players on on low fees. And you've got to say that Liverpool, you know, Man City are a different league. Man City have got advantages that other clubs don't have, and they've been at a sign Erling Haaland and, and Calvin Phillips. But Liverpool need to do it as a business. They need to bring players in and also sell players at the same time to make it work but they do it brilliantly they've got a fantastic business model the, the owners don't put a lot of money in just like the Glazers at Man United but where the Glazers at Man United repeatedly fail and they have plenty of money coming in through commercial revenues Liverpool beat them every time on the pitch and off it because they're smarter and they're more astute and it shows again this summer that they've they've kept the best player United are about to lose theirs they brought in some great signings United haven't brought any in and your Liverpool have done some great deals of getting players out of the club. And United haven't done any of that either. The only players United have lost are players that are left on a free transfer. So every part of recruitment and running a club is done brilliantly by Liverpool. And the big rivals at Man United, it's the opposite. Yeah, absolutely. And especially on, on the manager point of view, Jurgen Klopp with an important project. And we've seen constant changes for uh, Manchester United. Uh, speaking of maybe not so cheap transfers, what happened with Eden Hazard and what has happened with him. But apparently he has a new role. That's what uh, Ass at least has said. And apparently this new role would have to do with replacing Benzema when he isn't uh, available or if he wants to be physically fit, which of course we know he, he wants to be 150% for the World Cup. Sid, what do you you think of this? I think it's looking for a, a solution um, for a position that's problematic for Real Madrid and I think it's looking for a solution for, for Hazard himself and it's been a, a really really difficult time for him at Real Madrid. I think there was a period during last season when, when Ancelotti said publicly look this isn't really about is he fit, is he available. The bottom line is I've got players ahead of him who I like more at the moment. And that's Eden's biggest problem, is there are other players who I like more. And of course, that's to do with physical condition, to do with the sense that, that, that Hazard isn't the player that, that he once had been because he's been through so many injury problems. But it, but it was also, I think, about just the, the level of his performance. Now, this poses a really significant question, I think, about both Mariano and Jovic, who should have been the backup for Benzema and haven't succeeded at all. Ancelotti this year has played false nines. He's played Isco at false nine. He's played Asensio at false nine. He even pushed Modric right up the top of the pitch early in the season in, in Europe. And, and I think this really responds to that, about trying to find a solution, both for Hazard, if he's going to end up staying and there isn't anywhere that you can, that you can move him on to, there isn't anywhere that he wants to go, and trying to find some sort of role for him because the truth is that there just hasn't been one and it's really quite sad actually because this is a this this was at least a, a wonderful player and now of course everyone's clinging on to the hope that maybe by just giving him some minutes in a position that that, that potentially suits him and although I must confess I'm not sure if it does <laughs> that, that maybe they can get some kind of performance out of him <laughs> you're buying this Greg is this wishful thinking weekend or what? I mean, it's not happening. He's not going to get the best out of him. Replace. He's not going to replace uh, Benzema when he's injured or he or he's out because, as Sid mentioned, he was injured last year and he tried everybody in that position, couldn't make it work. He's not going to replace Valverde or Asensio. He's not going to replace Vinicius Junior, and that's a slight on him. And when Ancelotti says that one of the best players in the last 10 years in the Premier League, a guy who carried our former club mm -hmm. for quite a few seasons, pretty much on his own. When you've got Ancelotti saying, I actually prefer other players at the moment, that tells you what he's been all about at Real Madrid. And, and, and yeah, I get the injuries, but he hasn't looked after himself. He admitted it himself, he came back overweight. Now, this is not the 90s when we used to do that and think we could get away with it. The game has changed. The way that the players approach the game has changed. The way that the managers and the clubs and the sports scientists approach it 
Now, we wouldn't have liked it to a certain extent, pretty much, and specifically the British players, because it was new to us. But that's the way the games in these elite clubs are structured now. And when you go there, you've got to bet your bottom dollar that you, you have to adhere to what these clubs want to be the best that you can. And he has not been that. He's not even been close. So th this is just wishful thinking that you'll just plug him in all of a sudden and he lights up, the battery's recharged and he's going to be the old Eden Hazard. No, that's, that ship has sailed a good 24 months ago, it, in my opinion. It, it's really tough to think, especially, you know, wishful thinking, to think that we're going to see that version of him that we saw with Chelsea. Speaking of Chelsea, oh. Frank LaBeouf. Oh. We're taking advantage that you're here with us you have physically, so you can't run away. You no, can't say your, inter not. your internet is down because we want to ask you. It's cheap internet in France. Yeah. <laughs> the French one. Guys, yeah, I but... can't hear you. Yeah, I can't oh, hear you. Well, I'm sorry. Shut down. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to know mm -hmm. uh, an interesting list from you. Your five top worst transfers with Chelsea. Well, I'll tell Care you. Care to share? Uh, let, no, 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 no. <laughs> let uh, first. First, I want to say that I didn't think about Craig because oh, well, Craig has, uh, no 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 you were I know you were sweating a little bit next to me but no you're not because I, but I had lots of names but I had to make some choices so yeah Alvaro Morata uh, we are talking about 74 million pounds you know uh, Chris Sutton Force I played with Chris he came for 14 million and I remember Denis Wise saying did we keep the coupon did we keep the coupon <laughs> you were laughing the, the receipt <laughs> the receipt yeah well, and, Chris uh, was a good but you know is it, Chelsea Chris was a good player what, when he played for Blackburn yes. uh, the year before yes. he had a very good one yes. so so he was good Fernando Torres fantastic at, with Liverpool yes. and uh, a ghost I would say of himself uh, um, unfortunately for, for, for Chelsea um, that's sad but it's what it is you know of course, the second and the first you're going to guess easily a Kepa because of uh, lots of money and, uh, and many mistakes. And uh, that's very sad for the goalkeeper. We know we work with confidence and also for strikers that the same issues. Romelu Lukaku, uh, well, 97 million. I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. Can you, when you add those, uh, those money, you know, I could have had, you know, because I thought about my fellow compatriot Didier Deschamps. Who played one season with me and uh, we, he won the FA Cup, but they had a, didn't have a good season. But Bakayoko, drink water, Mosala, oh. Kevin De Bruyne. Kevin De Bruyne. Yeah, yeah. I could, have, I, I could yeah. have put those names on it, but that's what, it's, what football is. Yeah. You know, you can be successful with what one about club. A lad and from Everton, whose name escapes me, um, midfielder. Somebody help me out in my ear. Lad from Everton, come oh, on. Okay. Huh? Ross Barkley. Ross Barkley. Ross Barkley. Thanks, Ross Barkley. Well done. Well done, Mark. Isn't, it, isn't there a really obvious one missing here? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I say this not as, a, as an avid Chelsea viewer, but isn't Shevchenko the really big failure at Chelsea in terms of this is a guy who came as possibly the best striker in the entire world, was very much a presidential signing, sorry, a chairman's signing. Yeah, that's true. It just didn't happen. Yeah, but he was at the end of his career. I think it was more gift from Abramovich than anything else. And uh, nobody expected anything from him because we all knew that he was on the descent I would say, of his career. Uh, it's why I didn't put him. And mm -hmm. I so much suffer against Shevchenko when he plays for right. Milan and with Chelsea in the Champions League that I didn't want to put him in the list. <laughs> Mark? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think Timo Werner's lucky not to be on that list. Timo Werner's had a pretty bad couple of years at Chelsea, big fee. Yeah. And it, I think you've been very generous there, Frank, by not putting Timo Werner. And, and Juan Sebastian Veron, £15 million pound for Man United back in the day. I think he's played about 15, 20 games for Chelsea. So Veron, great player, but just didn't cut it at Chelsea. Uh, for, for Werner, we cannot put him because it's not the end of it. He's still there. You know, yeah. we're going to wait. Maybe we can have a renaissance. Yeah, you, you never know. Them, Frank. Tell them, Frank. So Kepa. Tell them. Yeah, Kepa, Kepa, we know that we'll never go back at the first part, you know, so it's done, it's done before it's the end of it. Well, it, it is a wishful thinking uh, weekend, apparently, here at ADSB yeah, NFC. Yeah. Anything can happen, and with that, you can follow along more live transfer talk on ESPNFC.com. Some sad news today. Andy Gorham has passed away at the age of 58. The legendary Scottish goalie not only played for Scotland, but also with Rangers. And Craig, you knew him well. Yeah, I mean, he was a teammate of mine with Scotland and he was a, a, 
a guy that was a fierce competitor in his time at Rangers when we played against him for in the old firm, the big, the big derby. He had most of his huge success at Rangers, but you know he was a, at one point he was the number one goalkeeper for Scotland. He had he was part of an era in the 90s with the late great Walter Smith, the manager who passed away not too long ago, where they had huge success. And they were unstoppable for many, many years in Scotland. And he was an unbelievable goalkeeper. He was never the biggest, well, never the biggest. He was not the tallest when you consider goalkeepers under six foot. He never looked the fittest, Andy. But in terms of shot stopping, and he broke the hearts, I can tell you, of a lot of Celtic players and a lot of Celtic fans and a lot of Celtic managers many, many times. When Celtic... And I remember before my time in the era of the, the late Tommy Burns and when they had Van Hooydonk and Cadet and Di Canio, they outplayed Rangers so many times but couldn't win the league. Because every time they faced Rangers, they faced Gorham. And Gorham was incredible. He was a man inspired in these big games. And to see the news of him being ill a couple of months ago and it being terminal and now him passing away so quickly... Uh, it's quite sad, 58 years old, but uh, I'm afraid cancer spares nobody and uh, he'll be remembered, Andy, as a fantastic, fantastic goalkeeper. It was a pleasure to play with him and it was really difficult to play against him. You know, when a football player dies, you know, you've, it's a little bit of yourself, you know, mm -hmm. which is hurt and, and, and in fact who dies because he's part of our generation and uh, I follow him, you know, playing Champions League and being absolutely fantastic also with, uh, with Scotland. So you feel hurt, really, like you knew him. I never met him, but uh, like you knew him. And uh, allow me to have a thought as well on uh, Paul Mariner, who used to work with us and, uh, and died like a year ago. And um, we all miss those people because they, they were... The great they were characters in the yeah. game. Yeah. The great characters in the game. I mean, the game has changed somewhat. And, and, you know, there's a microscope now that maybe thwarts the personalities of players coming out in the modern era. Not always, but sometimes. Because of the worry about social media and the cameras. And, and, and these guys... They were characters in their day, mm. and they lived life to the full, and it was a great era to play. No matter what anybody says, yeah, we didn't look after ourselves as we should have done, and there was not sports science, and blah, blah, blah. But boy, these guys had a great time. And I can tell you, the Rangers team, the Rangers players that Andy played in, we all respected them. Even though we were their biggest rivals, if we saw them out having a beer in Glasgow, mm. we'd go and have a beer with them, we'd have a chat and we'd buy each other a drink here and there, and then when we got on the field, we'd try and knock lumps out of each other. That's the way we did it back in the day, and Andy was a huge part of that. So, a pretty sad day for Scottish football, I have to say, with the loss of one of, one of the greats of the modern era. But what a beautiful way to remember someone who was a legend yeah. in Scotland. Rest in peace, Andy Gorham. We invite you to read this article, Greatest Women's Euros Moments, Goals, Controversies, From Prince's Brilliance to Prize Money and Pitches. Only a few days away, of course, from the Women's Euros. There's a talk about, of course, who could take it, Germany, Spain, or of course, host England. Italy played against Spain in preparation for this tournament, starting with Valentina Jancinti, who puts it into play, and Bergamaschi is the one who knocks it in. Not the best marking at the back post, I have to say. Just get caught under the ball and oh, a little bit of wrestling in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> a, a little bit of distraction there. Now Spain coming along in the 67th minute with Cardona. And of course, who else? The captain, Alexia Putellas, puts it behind the net. Yeah, filling the spot, you know, going uh, near post. Watch the goalie, watch the goalie. Uh, nowhere near it. <laughs> 1-1 one, one, Italy against Spain and of course there they are slight favorites Spain here are the odds now for the women's Euro starting in only a couple of days of France of course and England now with the excitement to be the hosts for the women's Euros and of course you'll be following them along and of course the tournament uh, Sid a lot of talk about uh, Spain especially with the squad that they have with Barcelona's success are they truly favorites with co-favorites England 
Uh, they don't want you to think that. Uh, I think there's been a very concerted effort from the Spain camp, in particular from the coach Jorge Vilda, to try and to try and play down the pressure and the expectation. In fact, he was talking about the what he described as an unreal level of pressure on them. The, the, the expectations were too high. He said, look, this is a national team that, for example, has never beaten Germany, has not beaten England. This is a national team that hasn't won anything at European level. And he felt that this had created kind of a bubble around the team, a bubble of expectation that at some point could burst on them. Obviously, a lot of that is built around the success of, of Barcelona, who, of course, were European champions last year, reached the final this year, although they did lose that final and had a very, very poor start to the game. They've been in three of the last four finals, this Barcelona team. So there's a sense of excitement building around them, that Alexia Puldeas is the, is the Ballon d'Or winner, so you're looking at a team and you think, wow, this is the basis of the Spanish national team, and genuinely the basis as well. Against Italy, eight of the starting 11 were Barcelona players, but of course one of the messages that's coming out of the Spanish national team squad is to say, look, this isn't the same as Barcelona. That although the core of the team is there, although the identity is there, although the way that we play is broadly similar, it's not the same as the Barcelona team, that maybe one or two of those players that, that really kind of tip you over the edge, that really make the difference at Barcelona are not Spanish. And Spain do have a problem at the moment, I think, in terms of dominating games and not scoring enough goals, or at least not scoring enough goals in those games that are a little bit more difficult. They'd, they'd scored seven against Australia, but just the one against Italy. And the Italian game was, I think, probably a case study in this. Spain totally dominated possession. Territorially, they were all over Italy, but they went 1-0 down. The first time they've been down, I think, in a game for, for over a year. I think it's 18 months or so now. Um, and had to come back and only managed to score once. So I think that would be the doubt. There's a little bit of fatigue as well. But I, I still think that Spain are, are definitely amongst the two or three sides that, that, that we can look at as, as potential favourites for this. Yeah, we know they're for sure going to miss a player like Jenny Hermoso now with the Women's Zero that yeah. kicks off July 6. Watch every game live on ESPN and on ESPN+. Plus. Now, of course, we have to say goodbye yeah. for now. We have to. But stick around Frank for will be back. extra time. Frank will be back I'll be with back. Craig. Lots of stories he's got. <laughs> right. for tons, extra, for tons of stories. Does, doesn't he always? <laughs> you can check out some of those stories on Extra Time. Why not? Thanks. How's it going? Welcome into Extra Time. Christine Alexander in the studio with Craig Burley and Monsieur Frank Leboeuf. Oui, bonjour. And Sorry. Sid Lowe <laughs> with us as well. <laughs> Sid, cheer up. Come on. Hey, hey, it's Saturday night. I know it's late in Spain. <laughs> Come on, you'll be opening that red wine shortly. Come on. Yeah, do eat late. No, well, if he's definitely. not opened it already, that yeah. is. What, what, makes you, what makes you think it's exactly? What makes you think it's not already open? <laughs> hey. Let, letting know. it breathe a little Wait, bit. Just tilt that camera down a little bit to make sure there's not a bottle of wine there. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not doing that. <laughs> Definitely right. not. He's having a, whenever he's not on camera, he's having a slight, yeah. a slight one. Zip. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? So, is, is it, it's five it o'clock somewhere, right? Is it just me that does that? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. Me. Confessions. No, I know. Confessions can't, can't, are next your time. No, the moral is hidden behind the books. Can't do that. Said, <laughs> read a lot. Yeah, do you read, really. said, I have a question for you, Said. You're, you seem like a very, and I don't mean a busy guy as in like busy nosy, but you're a busy guy in terms of work. <laughs> you're, but do you get time to read a lot? You seem to read a lot. No. <laughs> no, no. I wish I, 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 had, I had the same book in my bag for about eight months, <laughs> travelled right. everywhere with me, and never even got opened. Um, so, so during the season, I don't, get, I, don't, I don't get near it. But obviously, you read a lot of books for work, which normally means dipping in and out of them and taking information from them rather than actually sitting and reading them, but I, I, I managed to read, read a book last week, I was pleased with myself, actually read a book for the fun of it instead of for work. What book was that, Sid? I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've read, I've, I read again, it's only very short, I read uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, No One Writes the Colonel, and then I've just read a book called Perder, which is actually, I mean, talk about a busman's holiday, this is me supposedly reading a book for fun. It's a book by <laughs> a, a colleague of mine, a Barcelona-based journalist, talking about essentially that, I, I, I'm worried now that I'm, I might be projecting something here that I shouldn't really project. It's talking about the life of a football writer who basically kind of spirals into this depression through the fact that he's watching a team lose but realises that he's the biggest loser of all and it becomes very dark and uh, and very depressed. Is and, it a and, cautionary and tale then, Sid? Really quite, really quite <laughs> bad place and, and, and I was thinking to myself, I'm identifying with this guy a bit too much. I really, I really hope this isn't my fate.
Oh no. That could be any one of us on here though, couldn't it really? Let's yeah. be honest. You know, <laughs> dark place spiraling into something that we... You, you find know. out a little bit too much about, yeah. about how I pre uh, the football golf, clubs really I, I work. I pre-ordered the golf book about Tiger Woods and uh, Phil Mickelson and their relationship growing up through the years. It's not as deep as the book Sid's been reading. Uh, in fact, well, I couldn't tell you if it's that deep because it's, I haven't even opened a page yet. <laughs> really? And I've had it since April. Yeah. Oh. Just sat there on the bedside table, and I look sounds at every familiar. night. I look yeah, at every night like and go, Nah. Maybe later. Yeah, another time. All right, let's start up with the questions. For Craig and Frank. Yeah. Who do you want Chelsea to sign up top? Dembélé, Sterling, Rafinha, CR7, or Neymar? <laughs> a lot of choices. Well, we've been over the Neymar one mm -hmm. during the week. Neymar, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. Mm -mm. No. Don't have to. No. Well, I, I'm not first. Well, I'm not bothered who they sign. It's not my business, really. But I mean, they they will have to get some frontline players that 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 can be clinical. Mm -hmm. You know, Havertz has been a hit and a miss, even though they had a great goal in the Champions League final. Werner's been very disappointing. Zayech has struggled. I think he's he's. Technically very good, but he's been a bit lightweight and he's had injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, Hudson Adoy, not sure he's filled the potential, even though he's had an injury that Chelsea thought. I mean, Bayern Munich bid 30 million from uh, 18 months ago, whatever it was. And then Pulisic, the great American dream, it seems, is, <laughs> is in and out and injured. And yeah, so they need consistent players, basically. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, would, I would pick CR7. Okay. Cristiano Ronaldo because I think they need somebody to finish the actions and score and be, as you say, more clinical. Uh, Neymar is not going to happen. I don't think Tuchel wants him. Tuchel, sorry, wants him because he had so many issues when he was the coach of Paris Saint-Germain. I think Chelsea would really like Robert. I say to I, I think from the outside, although I would advocate for long-term building, I, I think sometimes you need to take some short-term approaches to fill a few gaps and I think they would really like Obviously, who isn't Robert Lewandowski? Yeah, but clearly, the apple of his eye is Barcelona and that huge club. I mean, why wouldn't it be? But I think if Chelsea could get him, can you imagine even in games where it's pretty average to have somebody that can just ban change it? Rafinha, I think Rafinha won't. I don't, if Ziyech stays, I don't see the point of getting Rafinha because there's so much look alike for me. And uh, so if Ziyech leaves, why not? Rafinha, I saw him playing for Ren and Leeds last season and he's very interesting. Sailing, I don't know. I still have some question marks about him. He's been, he's been good. He played many games, more, more than 40 games that season for Manchester City. But sometimes he can be so clumsy. And Dembele, we talked about Dembele a lot, you know, the, yeah. the, 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 con the non-consistency of, uh, of his football. Of course, it's, the talent is there, but the consistency was we want to see. Next question. Do you think CR7 could return to Madrid? And if so, where does he play without ruining what Benzema is doing? Can I say something? Yes. It's one of the many, many things that I hate. Not individuals, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's not talking about that. I'm talking about terminologies. CR7. Yes, that's drives right. me nuts. Yeah, you are R9, <laughs> CR7. Yeah. Are you CB something or? Yeah, I can't repeat it. <laughs> I just can't stand this CR7 sort of uh, analogy. You have no. Z. He's not a car. Z -Z. That's uh? the thing. He's not a car. He should be called CR7. No, he's not, not, I'm not buying a CR7. Yeah. We have a ZZ. So the question was, if she hasn't got a return of so where does he play? No, but no. He's not, as Sid was saying, I think Sid was talking about it on, yeah. on the live show. Uh, they have a very fine, whilst it's not the greatest Real Madrid squad by any stretch of the imagination, they had a very fine balance about them last year, mm -hmm. and, and that was enough to get them over the line. I mean, if you want, if you want to take a player who's probably playing the best football in his career at 34, and make him not play the best football in his career at 35, Bring Ronaldo in and see what happens to Karim and Benzema. Mm. So I don't think that's going to happen. Nost are you say nostalgia or nostalgia? Nostalgia. Nostalgia in, Eng in English. Uh, nostalgia is the worst word for me in the world, you know, in your life. Because when you're getting nostalgic, 
you're getting to back to a world you know that it won't be the same so it brings you regrets you would love to live that story same story again but it won't happen and you know that and uh, it's what happened maybe it's gonna happen to Pogba it's what happened to Pogba in Manchester United it's what happened to Cristiano Ronaldo in Manchester United last season and it might happen the same in Real Madrid it's gonna be nice for the fans to see him coming back but it's not gonna be the same story and of course is not, I think, going to be the same success. Yeah, it, it wasn't the same story with, with Zinedine Zidane. That's what we mentioned as well in the live show. So it's tough. Now, uh, Sid, this one's for you. Which Premier League team will be best fit for Diego Simeone? Well, I mean, you're talking about a man that resuscitated Atletico Madrid with a very clear sense of how he wants to play which is not everybody's cup of tea and so I suppose you look at this now and say well look for a, a, a club where you can draw certain parallels and perhaps you say Manchester United in terms of someone who goes and is given the, the if you like the freedom and the power and the authority to build a team and to try and raise that team up by changing things that are to do with the daily culture as much as the style of play by changing things that are to do with the attitude towards the way they play now look all of this falls apart a little bit when you talk about what Manchester United historically are associated with in terms of the type of football that they play. It doesn't entirely fit there. I wonder whether some of his uh, kind of charismatic approach could work outside an Atletico Madrid environment and particularly in an environment in which he doesn't speak English. And I think that would be problematic for him. So there's a bit of me that thinks that, that, that United would be, a club, uh, would be an option. The other one, I suppose, is to look down the league and say, is there a club that's potentially quite big, doesn't necessarily have hang-ups about style, but just wants to compete and be tough. And maybe you start thinking, Everton? Everton's a really big club, and I think we sometimes we sometimes overlook this. This is a big club in terms of its fan base, in terms of its history, but it, it, it feels like maybe someone like Everton would suit him. Everton? Manchester United? Well, Carlo Ancelotti tried with Everton. True. It didn't work. Yeah. But for sure, it won't be the Spurs. Spurs won't accept a defensive coach, you know, after Jose Mourinho. <laughs> I think they had their, their, their season with, uh, with that. Um, it's going to be tough. Yeah, I, I agree with Sid. I think, why not United? The new structure is somebody who, who have a structure, a defensive one, but it worked. So why not? Yeah. Okay. I think, well, I think Conte is slightly defensive, isn't he? I mean, they're not similar, but they're not dissimilar in a lot of ways. They, they, they like to, you know, like to rule with an iron fist. They like to change things to, to their own way. It's not exactly a silky style. Not quite Mourinho or, or no, whatever, no. but it, it's it's kind of, you look at the stats even from last year, uh, and I know he was making changes. There's a lot of times where they were happy just to defend. Uh, so I, I would have said Tottenham, but that was before, obviously, Conte went in there because he's kind of similar in terms of banging the table and fighting and agitated on the touchline and, and and that's the way both these managers operate. The fact that he doesn't speak English will be an issue. I remember Ranieri coming to uh, to Chelsea and uh, being our coach for, for my coach for a season and it was he needed at the time a player and it was Gustavo Poyet uh, we had to translate for him everything he was saying. Uh, we would happen to be Gianfranco Zola but one day because Gustavo uh, Poet was on the bench, he refused to uh, to translate. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh. so you know, it can, it can be a real issue. So. Oh, no. <laughs> Translate for me. No, no, no. no thanks. No, no, but really, uh, I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> I love Gustavo. Oh. You know that the word no is pretty universal <laughs> too, so he probably, oh, yeah. he probably yeah. understood that. Now, uh, Frank, what are your thoughts on Eric Cantona? You oh. never mention him when you talk about great French players. Eric Cantona was almost banned from the French football because of his comment and his attitude. I love the I love the personality. It was hard to cop with him. I had the chance to meet him in my last cap, my first cap and his last cap for France when we played in Poland. Uh, but I never found it difficult to play against him. I played when he was in Bordeaux. I played against him in Bordeaux. And I played when, he, when we played against Manchester United, the first season that I played, and we won at Old Trafford. Uh, I don't know him, and um, we barely followed... Was that the year that Dubry and Viali scored? Yes, exactly. 
And that was a fantastic assist from Frank Lebeuf. Oh, Frank, I was going to, I was going to mention it. <laughs> yeah, but I do it. I do it because you almost, you almost forgot, you know. So no, I didn't. I was playing in the game, and I was, I was going to bring it up. Don't, 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 no, don't. Sorry, I, I ruined it. Whatever. He was listening to Frank's greatest hits on his. Yeah, radio. that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. No, but really, uh, Eric. <laughs> Eric Cantona did something fantastic when he came back from his ban, uh, when he hit the, the, the fan and everything, and uh, with Manchester United, where they were 14 points uh, behind Newcastle, and he was playing and scoring goals and goals and goals, winning 1 0 for Manchester United, and that's why he's a legend. But he's not like the same legend in France. And, and, and he had to make some comment about the national team, like almost in 98 he was following England and not France. Uh, where he sad because Emi Jacquet again asked him to come as a striker. It would have been fantastic, fantastic to play sorry, Cantona sorry. as a striker, and he, <laughs> he refused because he wanted to play it's as one of number the, ten. It's one of the great Sir Alex Ferguson stories told by one of the ex players about what that day at Selhurst Park. For those that yeah. don't remember and need to look it up, is when he was sent off. And in the process of walking to the corner yeah. uh, where the, you enter the dressing room, he reacted to a fan in the crowd and, and Kung Fu, literally Kung Fu kicked this fan in the yeah, head, or yeah. tried to, and, and, and it was banned for a year, wasn't he? Six well, months, I think. Or yeah. months, nine yeah, months, yeah, whatever yeah. it was. Anyway, he got in the dressing room and uh, apparently, as legend goes, Sir Alex Ferguson came in and absolutely roasted a few players <laughs> about their performance. This is true. You're a disgrace, you're, you're a disgrace. You're a disgrace, that performance. And then he turned to Eric Cantona and went, Eric, you can't be doing that. <laughs> he loved him. He, he, loved him. He, said, he said, Eric, you can't be doing that, son. That's a bit much. And everybody's going, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <"This is> <laughs> How is he not getting the biggest <laughs> roller oh, that's I know, because I talked with uh, Sir Alex Ferguson about, about Eric. You and it was he, Eric was like a son to, uh, to uh, Sir Alex Ferguson. Aww. That was amazing, the, the, the relationship that they, they, they got. I mean, again, Eric was almost banned from France. Uh, made a try at Sheffield Wednesday, I think. Um, and yeah. then went to Leeds, Leeds. And won the, the league with Leeds and signed for the enemy for Manchester United and been so successful with Manchester United. I give the credit for that, but when I played against him, I never find any difficulties playing against him. Maybe, I don't know, I was lucky that those days, but uh, that's it. But I have to, of course, refer him as a legend because of what he did. Yeah, as a player, player on the pitch. That was fine. No yeah. questions asked. No questions. But English people, they don't, Part they're not the very pen. good in football. Well, uh, <laughs> it, was, it took, I, it took uh, Two penalties in the 94 FA Cup final. I know, when you lost 4 nil. Yes. I know. And he slotted them in. I think he took two. I might be wrong. I think it was, yeah. And he walked up to the ball and <laughs> stroked it in as if it was a Sunday afternoon in the back garden with his yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah, Seriously, yeah. he was like... He's a boys. great actor nowadays. Yes. What, what are you? Oh, you're not a great actor. You would say that. I cannot say that. No, know. I said all right. No, okay. but we. Hold on. Are you tell me you've, you've you've just taken a humble pill? Yes, a I know. Ago. I know. Just now. Just now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought the effects. I thought the effects of it will be a little a bit earlier, but it wasn't. But uh, no, no. But he's a, he's a great actor. I saw him in many movies and in the play, and mm -hmm. he's a great actor. Well, he's a complete person. What is it with you, French, going into acting? Oh, well, Vinnie Jones is an actor as well. By the way, he's how Welsh. He's not English. He's not Scottish. Not Scottish. He's English. Yeah. How no, he's Welsh. He did. He did brilliantly, did he not? Uh, Eric? No, no. Vinnie Jones. Uh, in Lock, Trump? stock, and two smoking barrels. Have you seen that? Yeah, that yeah. was great. With uh, Brad. When he uh, shot that guy's head in the is door. Is that with Brad Pitt? Movie? Yes. Yeah, when he played the uh, yeah the, the hard guy. The hard guy and the swordfish with John Travolta. You have ah. a question? No, I, 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 no I need a list of movie recommendations, <laughs> yeah. uh, apparently, for, for this long weekend. Jonesy was a hard boy, though. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You, nice know, you know what? I remember playing with the first year, we played against Wimbledon, uh -huh. and Vinnie Jones was playing for Wimbledon, and I was smashing the head on the line uh, by Robbie Hurl, who played <laughs> against, who, who, was, who used to work with us. And the thing is, the, um, I was trying to save the ball on the line, and Robbie Hurl had bumped me, and didn't never, never touch the ball, and the, bo the ball came in, came in the goal and the, the, the referee didn't say it was a foul and say it's a goal. And I, I had a bump on my head and Vinny came to me and said, hey, welcome to England, Frankie. 
yeah, yeah. That was, that, we lost 40 at Stamford Bridge. That was a crazy game. Well, what, what I'm going to watch, re-watch, is a theory of everything. Oh, yes. Yeah. I have a one minute, exceptional minute yes. in that movie. The Swiss, the Swiss doctor. The Swiss doctor. The Swiss it's doctor. Me. Oh, is, what, what's he doing? Moving a plant? No, I'm... Is he coming in carrying like a, a no, plant? Check it out. I, I tried to say that Stefan Okin, played by Eddie Raymond, uh, has to stop to leave. So I want to stop the machine. And his wife will say, no, that's a real story because it's a biopic. I, I know, I know what Sid's thinking. Mm. He's thinking, I'm in Spain. <laughs> It's very late, <laughs> and I really don't want it. I well, really can, I can read a book. You know? right, I think I'm very good at reading people's uh, yeah, minds. Yeah. I'm very good at reading people's minds, and I think Sid's reading is, is why don't they shut up? So I'd rather have, I'd rather have the eight month Do you, do you have a question for Sid before he goes to bed? Question for Sid, Frank Craig, but we'll let Sid start on this one. What are your thoughts on Langlet to Tottenham? I think this is quite an interesting one because uh, Clement Longley for a long time I thought was low-key excellent. He, he would play very steadily, he would be very much in control and he, he was uh, not a particularly demonstrative defender but he would do everything right. For the last 18 months or so he's been incredibly accident prone, given away a lot of penalties, uh, made a lot of mistakes, has looked completely out of confidence in a defensive structure that's really not working and in an environment in which, and obviously you're saying this from the outside and you can never be sure, he just doesn't seem to feel comfortable. He just doesn't seem to feel, feel at home and has ended up slipping out of the Barcelona team. And to be perfectly honest, right now, isn't a great player. But the optimist in me thinks that in the right environment, with the right kind of structure, with a manager that, that builds a defence in the right way, that this could be actually quite a useful signing for Spurs. Um, I don't know if they'll play him in a, in a two or a three, but, but I, I think if you just want a steady defender who defends well and you can get him physically and emotionally and, and psychologically right, then I think he can be a useful signing. But it is true that for the last year or so, he, he really hasn't been that great. Yeah, I will back. I will completely back up uh, Sid on that uh, on that matter because Longley has been a fantastic player and uh, struggled uh, the last uh, 18 months. He's going to go back, and I'm sure at Tottenham he's going to be with Conte very uh, very useful and uh, and uh, and do what he has to do because he. I saw him like three four years ago. It was huge for the national team and for Barcelona. It was yeah. huge. So I, I want to believe that uh, he can go back to his best. Just want to say to English people that Longley means the English. Oh, it's not the same spelling, but Longley yeah, means the English. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, completely different spelling, but mm. true. Frank, I'll stick with you. Now that oh, Zidane. Please don't. <laughs> please don't. <laughs> Because Sid wants to go, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm a smidge behind. That's uh, okay. It's your yeah, night. So tell me, what days are you in this week? Uh, I just worked today and tomorrow, so I, I'm, I'm going to be out. Uh, I know next week I'm going to work on Wednesday, Friday, and next Sunday. <laughs> texting Steve. Steve, you want to be off? Texting Thursday. <laughs> just texting the boss. What day did you say again? Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday next week. Tomorrow, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday next week. You seen my schedule? <laughs> Well, are you <laughs> also on Wednesday, uh, Thursday, Friday? And have you, put, have you yeah, seen my schedule? Frank Frank says to, I say to Steve Palisi, you know, mm -hmm. I want to be very close to Craig. <laughs> because I want him to suffer for what he says on TV. That's, if I didn't need proof that I'm heading out in this show, then I've, I've got it now. Just put me on with you. They want to give you a hard time, and I am the hard time. They're going to be As soon as we're done, we're going to see a dust cloud That's okay. and Craig's That's going to okay. be running Imagine, out the door. Hold on, I'm going on Prime. <laughs> Earmuffs. <laughs> Earmuffs. I just, I, just, I just love this idea of Craig waking up in the morning and Frank standing by his bed and just saying, I'm your worst nightmare. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, almost that, yeah. No, I'm if I wake just... up in the morning and say what we, we, I'll say what we used to say all those years ago at the old training ground. And it was repeated across the board <laughs> by almost every player. <laughs> Russians, Norwegians, Italians, even the French. For God's sake, Frank, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I am I'm very enthusiastic about life and I have to share it. But people really? don't get me. That's the, yes. that's the main problem that we have. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you, you know what? Tomorrow, do you, do, do you have, a starting, do you have a starting at golf tomorrow at 7.30? No. No, oh, because I would have been there. Just to encourage you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Wednesday, Friday. Oh my God. Sh shall we, Frank? Yeah. Let's try this again. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Now that Zidane has turned 50, yeah. can we finally get to hear what Materazzi said to him to make Zidane headbutt him? 
like that in the 2006 World Cup final. That's something that we cannot say on, in, uh, on that channel, I guess. Uh, oh. Well, I, I was told because I never had a discussion about that uh, to, uh, with Zizou, but I, I think he insulted his uh, mother and his, si his sister. Yeah. That's what I know. That was the gist. Yeah. Well, I've been insulted a lot and uh, I won't name people saying that uh, as a French guy I should go back to my country. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I won't name name, I won't, but uh, yeah, it can happen. So it shouldn't have reacted. Dennis either. Wise. No, 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 because Steve he Clark. was playing with me, but some others, yeah. All the players. No, all, almost, yes. Yeah, no, no, some no, people say, no, no. shut up, you French. <laughs> <laughs> all right, with that, no, I think We were actually it's... nice to Frank. Yeah. yeah, they were. It was, it was a bit uh, of bad. He loved it. Friends. Listen, he loved it. And on top, I wasn't speaking English. I was talking to them, but not in English. <laughs> what do you think you're speaking now? <laughs> I don't know, barely, but... <laughs> all right. Right. With that, Sid we're going to wrap Sid up. Can go. We're yeah. wrapping up. All Extra boy. time. Sid can have his Vinito Tinto, Tinto de Verano, ESPN FC available daily on ESPN Plus. Claro que sí. 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 Claro que sí.